Okay, so next on the agenda is a presentation from uh, Dr. Mike Lauer, the Director of the Office of Extramural Research, and I've asked Eric to do his introduction, please. And I'm delighted to do that. Let me just try to get rid of one more window if I can. There we go. And is, is Mike on? Uh, he sure is. Mike. Yeah, just got, I got to see where he was in the Zoom window. Hi, Mike. Thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure to introduce a good friend and colleague of NHRI's, Dr. Mike Lauer. I suspect many of you know exactly who Mike is, um, since you're all in the extramural research program. And let me just give you a little bit of background. Mike brings a distinguished and highly accomplished career, um, both outside of NIH and more recently in, in, in NIH. He uh, trained as a physician at Albany Medical College, further clinical training at Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health got involved in, in the Framingham Heart Study early on in his career, but then he spent 14 years at Cleveland Clinic as professor of medicine, epidemiology, and biostatistics, where he was a highly accomplished clinical researcher. Uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute was fortunate to recruit Mike to NIH back in 2007, and from 2007 to 2015, he served as the division director um, at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. But then uh, Mike uh, was appointed the uh, NIH uh, uh, Deputy Director for Extramural Research, um, where he has just done a fantastic job uh, leading that important uh, Office of Extramural Research and the Office of the Director. Uh, many of you are familiar with his Open Mike blog and various other ways that he communicates. I would just say at a personal level, I've known Mike uh, for many years, dating back when he was at Heart, Lung, and Blood, as, as many other senior members of NHGRI staff. And, He's just a great friend, great colleague, one of these people who's always approached, incredibly collegial. And since taking over uh, the Office of Extramural Research, I think he's done a spectacular job and continues to be incredibly interactive and helpful uh, just, just constantly. Um, what, what council wanted to hear from him about is uh, in the category of duties otherwise assigned um, because of his role in overseeing extramural research um, at NIH, he was called into uh, a, a number of very complicated uh, circumstances related to foreign interference um, has, and has therefore become the point person in many ways at NIH for a, a large set of very complicated issues that um, has taken up an immense amount of his time on top of all of his other responsibilities. But it's great that he could spend a little bit of time with us to inform council and people watching uh, remotely in our open session, this is a very important topic and Mike has been an incredibly effective NIH leader in helping NIH navigate through um, these issues, both uh, dealing with acute issues and, and how to prepare us for dealing with such issues going forward. So with that, Mike, I'll turn it over to you and thanks so much for joining us. Great, Eric, thank you very much and really appreciate that very kind introduction. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So it gives me an enormous pleasure um, to be here today and to give you uh, have this opportunity to tell you a little bit about some of the work that uh, we've uh, been doing. And I like Eric's uh, description of this as duties, um, uh, other, other duties as a sign, because that seems to be exactly what this is. I'm sure you've seen some of these headlines. Um, the one on the left, Florida Center, referring to the Moffitt Cancer Center, details fired scientists linked to China. In this particular case, the uh, CEO uh, of Moffitt uh, had a link, uh, had a contract with the Thousand Talents program in China, and there were a number of other scientists involved as well. In the upper right-hand corner, the University of Florida swiftly addressed foreign research controversy. Uh, they had a number of professors there, including one uh, who was a vice president of a Chinese university, unbeknownst to everybody. Uh, going on down, uh, this made a lot of news. The uh, chair of the uh, Department of Chemistry at Harvard, uh, Charles Lieber, uh, was arrested for lying to the Defense Department and the NIH, and more recently has been indicted uh, for uh, filing false tax returns because of failure to report Chinese income. And then on the lower right-hand corner, um, Emory professor uh, had a criminal charge linked to Chinese government program. I'm gonna talk about that one um, in a little bit more detail since that did get quite a bit of attention. Go on to the next slide. These uh, headlines and what I'm about to talk about uh, fall into three major buckets. Uh, one is undisclosed research support. And that includes undisclosed employment, uh, including Thousand Talents contracts, as well as undisclosed grants from foreign agencies. In some cases, the NIH is effectively funding the exact same work that other granting agencies uh, are supporting. 
The second is perhaps one that's a bit easier to understand and that's undisclosed conflict of interest. And then the third are peer review violations. So let's go to the next slide. And we're gonna start by talking about what, what we have referred to as shadow laboratories. Um, this is uh, manifestations of undisclosed Chinese employment and grant research support. Next slide. In January of 2018, uh, in the career guide section of Nature, this article appeared. What is China's Thousand Talents plan? The nation's bid to lure back expat scientists and recruit highly skilled foreign researchers is now in its 10th year. This was a highly complimentary article, and it suggested that for some scientists, this may be a way to obtain research support. But this is not an ordinary research support program. It's a recruitment program, and that's pointed out here in the headline. If we go to the next slide, Th these are quotes that are taken straight from the Nature article. To apply, you must already have a firm job offer from a Chinese institution. All applicants must have worked at renowned universities outside China, and all applications to the Thousand Talent Scheme go through the Chinese university employer. Now, this is a very important point. People, scientists who are employed by American institutions who are trying to get support from the Thousand Talent Scheme are not applying through their American institutions. They're applying to their Chinese university employer whom their American institutions often know little or nothing about. We're gonna show you some examples of that in just a bit. Next slide. So the key problem here is non-disclosure. Uh, in late 2018, and then again in early 19, the Hoover Institution issued this report called China's Influence in American Interests, Promoting Constructive Vigilance. They point out that China's most systematic channel for identifying foreign-based non-traditional collectors is the Thousand Talents Program. Non-traditional collector is an interesting term, and I'm going to talk about that also in a bit. This is a recruitment program. Now, it was stated at that time that official websites list more than 300 U.S. government researchers and more than 600 U.S. corporate personnel who have accepted Thousand Talents Program money. In many cases, these individuals do not disclose the Thousand Talents Program money to their employer, which for U.S. government employees is illegal and for corporate personnel likely represents a conflict of interest that violates their employment ag employee agreement. And in fact, now what we have seen is that this is also an important problem within biomedical uh, academia. Next slide. Let me um, take one last background step before we, we uh, get into the depth here and uh, bring up what, what is uh, hopefully what you'll see is an obvious question, which is what is a recruitment? The Thousand Talents Program and the hundreds of other related programs in China are recruitment programs. So here is a highly oversimplified model of the world. There is an American university on the left and a Chinese university on the right. Each university has an academic leader and one scientist. Okay, if you click. Now let's say that this Chinese academic leader sees this American scientist and would like to recruit the American scientist to China, offers a package and is successful in doing that, click. And now this uh, scientist has moved over to the Chinese university. This is a standard recruitment. Um, there's this kind of thing happens all the time. Uh, and of note, and this again may seem perfectly obvious, the American academic leader in the upper left-hand corner knows what has happened. Th this leader knows that there is one less scientist working at their university. And therefore one thing they're not going to do is submit an application to NIH identifying that scientist as a principal investigator. Hopefully all that is completely obvious. Next slide. So now I'm going to show you how a thousand talents program uh, recruitment works. So the first thing that happens is, is that a person will submit uh, an application. They may be nominated to. The applications, and we've now seen quite a few of them, the applications look like grant applications. They go on for many pages. Uh, there's a description of scientific background. There's a description uh, of the candidate. And then let's say that, that the um, application goes through review and uh, looks like um, it's going to be successful. So then what will happen is the person will get a document that looks like this. Uh, it says thousand, uh, you can think of this as a just-in-time notification. National Thousand Talents Program shortlisting notification. This is an actual um, shortlisting notification that was sent 
to a well-funded scientist working in a prestigious American university. It says uh, to this person, after the experts review and approval of the working group on the transfer of high level foreign talents, you are officially shortlisted in the National Thousand Talents Program. According to the related provisions, you would enjoy the corresponding working and living benefits and receive a certain amount of financial support after you have performed the work contract. Notice is hereby given. One important point about this uh, document is the heading. And the heading is the Organization Department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China. The, the talents programs are political programs. They're run out of a political organization, in this case, the Communist Party of China. And in fact, we've seen uh, uh, recently uh, uh, application guides which point out that the political stance of the candidate is an extremely important part of their uh, uh, of the likelihood that they're going to get supported uh, by the program. Okay, so that's the first part here is to note that this is a political document. The second is the Can point. Ask about a really quick question: is, yeah. is there a distinction in China between the Communist Party and the government and the government? Yes, um, so that's a great question. Now, this is not my, my immediate ex area of expertise, but I would point out that prior to the Thousand Talents Program, there was something called the Hundred Talents Program. The Hundred Talents Program was run by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, which is a government program. It was felt that um, that program was not being successful. They were not recruiting the numbers of scientists that they were hoping for. And so the Thousand Talents Program was an attempt by the uh, by the political apparatus to take this over because they thought they could do a better job. But that, that's a very good question. Okay, uh, next slide. All right, so this is an example of what a contract looks like. So the other point I wanted to make from the previous slide is that there is a mention of a work contract. Uh, so these Thousand Talents Awards involve uh, a contract. It's, it's a hybrid between an employment contract and a research grant. We have now seen dozens of these contracts, and this is just an example of one. This one actually happens to come from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, but we've seen contracts from various universities. Um, there is a um, Party A and a Party B. Party A uh, is the employer, in this case, the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And Party B is, um, is the NIH-funded uh, researcher. Uh, these contracts go on for uh, many pages. In this case, um, one key point here is uh, the position and term of employment. It says Party A employs Party B as a professor in the Thousand Talents program for a period of five years. The employment period is from 2014 to 2019. Party B shall work full-time at Party A premise as a professor effective from the commencement date of this contract. Now, in this particular case, and we've seen other cases like this, this person was, was working full-time at an American institution, and that American institution was representing this person as a full-time employee to NIH. Um, th that American institution had no idea that this person had signed a full-time contract uh, with a university or with an uh, entity in China. Okay, there's another part of this contract that's interesting job objectives during the employment period, the laboratory in the United States will be gradually moved back to China to rebuild. The idea here is to uh, effectively reproduce the lab that exists in the United States and move it to China, again, without the knowledge uh, of the American institution. Okay, next slide. This was uh, uh, an, uh, a, re, um, a report from the Department of Justice uh, regarding a, a, a postdoc by the name of Xin Wang, who was um, arrested at LAX while he was planning to leave to China. He had a postdoc position at UCSF. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because within the document, so if you click, um, there is a, a statement that this person had uh, linkages to the uh, PLA. So he was a biomedical researcher, but he had linkages to the uh, People's Liberation Army. Uh, he had a position of, of major uh, within the army. And the director, his supervisor within the PLA had told him to observe the layout of the UCSF lab and bring back information on how to replicate it to China. So this is just another example of one of the key purposes of this operation is to uh, move, basically transfer the knowledge, the know-how, the methodology. And in some cases, um, we've actually uh, are, are aware of cases where it's down to the wing nut. Uh, that, that kind of information gets transferred from the United States to China without the knowledge of the American uh, institution. Next. 
Okay, now the contracts also include provisions as well as uh, expected deliverables. So here's an example. This is from a different contract. Uh, party A shall provide Party C. In this case, Party C is a different American researcher, very well funded by um, NIH. So in this case, this person gets a basic startup research fund with an accumulative amount of uh, 8 million RMB, which is about $1.2 million. So this is a research fund uh, provided to this person, again, without the knowledge of the American institution, without the knowledge of the NIH. There are expected deliverables in response to this. And if you look on the bottom here, uh, it says within three years of project implementation, uh, this scientist is, is expected to deliver two to three patents domestic patents. And by domestic patents, that means Chinese patents. We've actually seen now a number of cases where Chinese patents are being, um, uh, are, are being uh, issued by American inventors who are putting on their Chinese patents materials that clearly come from NIH funded work. Okay, next slide. All right, so as a reminder, uh, this is what a clean recruitment looks like. Uh, the uh, person has, has relocated to the uh, Chinese university and the American academic leader knows exactly what's going on. But if you click um, in a thousand and click again, um, in a thousand talents recruitment, uh, what has happened is that the person has a, an appointment in China, but they maintain their appointment in the United States. And the, um, the American university either knows nothing about what's going on or they know something. They may know that their uh, employee has a part-time position in China, but they don't really understand exactly uh, what it means. They may think that their employee is giving lectures or doing seminars, uh, but don't, they don't understand that their uh, employee actually has um, a laboratory. Uh, so in other words, their, their understanding is, is incomplete. So if we move to the next slide, uh, this is an example of how um, the American uh, institutions are completely unaware of what's going on. This is an email that was sent from a um, institutional president to uh, one of his faculty members. And it reads like this, Dear Dr. X, we were unaware of these additional funding sources until the communication from Dr. Lauer at NIH. We have obtained translations of these applications and contracts. Regarding the Thousand Talents program, you indicated that this was an honor program comparable to an academic title. It is clear from the contract that this program includes provision of space, staff, and funds for laboratory research and expected research deliverables. Now, it, it should be clear, but in this case, the American um, academic leader, the, the, the university president, had seen the contracts. And, um, did, and the, the scientists did not know that their uh, university leader had seen the contract. So I want to point out a couple of things here. Uh, one is, as I've mentioned before, the American academic institution is unaware of what's going on. The second is that there are, there's a lie. The, uh, the scientist told a lie about what the Thousand Talents program um, actually is, not knowing that um, his university leadership knew the truth about what was uh, going on. And we have seen lots of lies. I'll give you some examples of some of the other lies um, that we've seen before. But some of the lies that we've seen, uh, like this one, are rather remarkable. Can I ask something? Do you, does NIH consider lies by omission to be lies as well? Well, there, there are obligations um, to disclose all financial support. Um, and uh, in a way, it's not really a lie by omission because when, uh, when the application gets submitted, um, it has to be, there's an attestation that the application is complete and accurate. So if there's a knowledge that the application is not complete, then that's an, an effectively an act of commission by omission. It's a good question. No, good answer. Thanks. Okay. Uh, next slide. All right, now here's another example of the US institution not being aware of what's going on. This is taken from the criminal complaint against Xiaojiang Li. Uh, this was the uh, scientist at Emory University, a lot of press about this. Um, this is from the criminal complaint. Dr. Li certified that his uh, effort at, enemy, uh, at Emory was 100%. And uh, he certified this numerous times, 75% of his time working on grants, 25% of his time doing teaching and, and various other things. In fact, he was spending 60% of his time uh, in China. He had paid positions at the Chi Chinese Academy of Sciences. He also had a paid position at Jinan University. And during all this time, he was being supported as an FTE at Emory and uh, NIH was paying Emory 
uh, thinking that he was um, working 100% of the time uh, at Emory. And in fact, that wasn't uh, the case. So this is, a, again, another example of where the American institution is not aware of what their employee is doing. Okay, next slide. So we have seen now dozens of these foreign employment agreements. Uh, they're not all Thousand Talents programs. There, there, there are hundreds of these programs, uh, but th these are some common themes. Um, there's a time commitment. It can be a month, it can be two months, it can be full time. There's substantial funding for research and we've seen some of these contracts that includes uh, millions of dollars uh, of support. I think the largest one we've seen so far uh, was a $5 million startup fund. Uh, they get a laboratory uh, for uh, free, they get equipment, they get personnel, which they don't have to pay for. Uh, they also get paid a salary. Uh, you may have heard that uh, Charles Lieber was alleged to have received a salary of $50,000 a month. Um, most of the salaries are less than that, but nonetheless, they, they are substantial. There's a housing benefit, which is typically seventy-five dollars to $150,000 a year, so they don't have to pay for their housing in China. In return for this, they are expected to produce deliverables. These include papers. Um, we've seen contracts that will say, you will have at least one paper in Science, Nature, or Cell, or you will have five papers or 10 papers that appear in journals that have an impact factor of 10 or higher. These are some of the, uh, uh, some of the, some of the language we've seen. Um, sometimes there are patents. I showed you an example of that from a previous contract. We've also seen a few contracts that stipulate training requirements, including training in the United States. So the, the contract will say, you will bring to your lab in the United States people from our university um, who are part of the Youth Thousand Talents programs, and they will be trained in your American lab and then come back um, to China. Uh, now, obviously, uh, this creates conflicts of commitment or conflicts of interest. The most obvious kind of conflict of, of commitment is if you have a full-time job in China, you can't have a full-time job in the United States at the same time because 12 plus 12 is greater than 12. Okay, next slide. All right, now the money is an interesting part of this, and this uh, became quite prominent. It became prominent in the Charles Lieber case, uh, but it, it, this is another example. This is the program at Moffitt. Uh, where, uh, or the, the event at Moffitt, where it was discovered that six people, including the CEO, had signed contracts with the uh, Thousand Talents program. And if you click again, um, the internal investigation, which was then submitted to the Florida legislature, uh, indicated that top leaders and researchers at the Cancer Center had opened personal bank accounts in China and had received unreported personal payments and other research support. So we see different kinds of money. There is money, like I've shown you before, specifically for research. You're, you're, given, you're given a research fund. That research fund goes to the university in China, and that research fund is then used to build up a research program. Then there's also personal money. Personal money could be in the form of salary, travel, um, housing. Uh, and it's, it's interesting. We, we've seen these um, exchanges where, there, where there's discussion about how the personal money shall be handled. Some of it shall be uh, transferred in cash. Some of it shall be put into um, uh, bank accounts in China. By the way, they, they, the bank accounts are always in China. They, they never transfer money uh, directly here to the United States. Okay, next. So the Emory case um, is an example of where the money became quite relevant. Uh, this is what eventually he pleaded guilty to, was he filed false tax returns uh, Dr. Lee made $500,000 um, in personal um, compensation while he was in China. This $500,000 was not reported to Emory. It was not reported to the NIH, and it was not reported to the IRS. Um, and there may be now a, a number of other cases um, in which uh, this is how the government is going to uh, pursue um, the, the uh, problematic behavior. Okay, next slide. All right, so I've talked about the, uh, the, the uh, contracts. Uh, when you get a job at a Chinese university, just like in an American university, uh, one of your um, opportunities uh, and perhaps expectations is to apply for grant support. So you can apply for a grant support to any of a number of Chinese granting agencies. And, and here uh, we are actually talking about a, a government organization. So as an example, the National Natural Science Foundation of China, uh, this is a, a funding agency. This is an example uh, of an application that was filled out uh, by um, an American researcher, very well-funded American researcher. These applications look very much like 
an NIH or NSF application. They go on for many pages. They include forms. They include scientific uh, material. They include uh, the equivalent of biosketches. And if we go to the next slide, uh, one of the uh, frequent, uh, well, we see this in virtually all of these, is a table uh, of the project team. So here's an example of a, of a table. And in this case, line one, uh, it was a, an American scientist, uh, again, extremely well-funded uh, uh, American scientist uh, who functioned as the PI. And in the right column, he indicates that he is going to spend um, 10 person months a year working on this grant. Now, this person um, had committed himself to something like six or seven months of, of, um, of support on NIH grants. So th this obviously uh, is a problem. And we have seen quite a few cases um, like this where there's clear um, overcommitment. Next slide. Another uh, problem are uh, duplicate grants. Um, so this is a simplistic view of this, but where the American grant and the Chinese grant um, are highly similar, uh, overlapping, or in some cases, just plain downright identical. Uh, we, we, we had one case where a translator essentially said, I'm going to stop translating here because you have the translation. Uh, it was the um, uh, grant that was submitted to NIH. By the way, we have seen both, um, both patterns. We have seen cases where a grant is funded by the NIH. It is then translated into Chinese and submitted to the National Science Foundation of China for their support. We have seen cases where the grant is funded by the National Science Foundation of China and then translated into English and submitted to us um, for our support. We've also seen cases where uh, people will submit their um, RPPR, their American NIH progress report, and they'll translate the Chinese and submit it to, um, to the Chinese granting agency for their Chinese um, um, progress report. So uh, we have found ourselves funding grants that are identical to or highly similar to Chinese grants. So investigators are double dipping and not disclosing. And at this point, we have already received, I believe, millions of dollars. We're certainly well over a million dollars, but I think we're, we're now into the multiple millions of dollars of reimbursements from American universities because we were funding duplicate grants. Needless to say, unbeknownst to the institution. All right, now there are um, civil implications. Um, and uh, actually this gets back to your earlier question. Uh, failure to disclose um, is a problem. Uh, last December, the US Department of Justice, this was one of our earlier cases, uh, reached a $5.5 million false claim settlement with the Van Andel Research Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan, because of two scientists who failed to uh, disclose substantial grant support that they were receiving uh, from, uh, from China. So this is an example of a civil implication where uh, one of our referrals led to a, um, a, a civil settlement. Okay, next. And then there are also criminal implications. Uh, this is a case that was announced a few months ago. Uh, it involved a, a scientist uh, at uh, Cleveland Clinic or former scientist at Cleveland Clinic uh, who was a thousand talents participant uh, he also um, had received uh, extensive grant support from China uh, for overlapping work. Uh, so a criminal complaint was filed here. And then if you go to the next slide, uh, this is another case. This was just announced uh, a couple of months ago um, of a, a scientist um, who was uh, at Ohio State University. Um, he uh, was, uh, the Department of Justice um, alleges, was involved in a scheme to use $4.1 million of grant money from China, from NIH, to develop uh, Chinese expertise in rheumatology and immunology. He uh, knew that uh, he was being um, investigated, uh, and so he boarded a plane to go to China. He was met by um, uh, agents in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, and then brought back to Columbus. Uh, this is a case that, that is still pending. Okay, next slide. All right, so I've talked about the uh, undisclosed um, uh, um, employment, the un undisclosed contracts, and the undisclosed grants. Uh, the next item to talk about are undisclosed financial conflicts of interest. And in a way, this one may be a bit easier to understand. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is a, um, a report that was issued in 2017. Uh, it was uh, written uh, primarily in Mandarin. Um, of the uh, Kangju Kangrui Biological Pharmaceutical Technology Company. And if you, you look at the logo, uh, you can guess what uh, this company is focused on. It's focused on genetic diseases uh, of the eye. Now, Kangrui stands for Kang Zhang. Uh, he's the uh, husband. 
uh, and Rui is his wife. And the two of them uh, who were uh, based in San Diego set up this company to develop technologies for um, genetic eye research. Um, they did not disclose this company. The company at that time was worth about um, not quite $12 million. Kang Zhang had 49% equity in the company and his wife, uh, Rui Ho, had uh, 27% uh, equity. So between the two of them, they, they basically own this company. And if you go to the uh, next um, slide, uh, this is an example of a paper that they published. And there were multiple other papers that look quite similar. So Rui Ho is one of the... Um, is one of the uh, authors. She identifies one affiliation, and that's the um, Kang Rui Biological Pharmaceutical Technology Company in Gangzhou. Um, the senior author is Kang Zhang. He identifies a number of affiliations, which included UCSD. His uh, primary affiliation was uh, Sichuan University in Chengdu, China. Um, he did not include um, the company as one of his affiliations, even though he had 49% equity in it. And uh, under author information, it says the authors declare no competing financial interests. This was a pattern was repeated in multiple other papers that um, these two uh, published. They did not disclose their, uh, their Chinese um, conflicts uh, to UCSD uh, or to the NIH. By the way, there were multiple other problems with Kang Zhang as well. Uh, he uh, resigned his position in July of 2019. Okay, next. The third kind of problem that we've seen um, are peer review breaches. And uh, perhaps the uh, best known is uh, next one. Um, next slide. So this was um, reported first in the cancer letter and then it appeared on the front page of the New York Times in, in November of 2019. This was an MD uh, Anderson uh, researcher, very well funded by NIH, uh, who was serving on the study section. Uh, as a member of the study section, he had access, of course, to dozens of applications. Uh, he then uh, sent these applications uh, to China. He emailed them, and he would say things like, um, this is, uh, here's the bone and meat that you need, keep it to yourself. Uh, some methods you may learn from this proposal, but keep it confidential. Um, so this person was essentially emailing confidential grant applications to colleagues in China uh, needless to say, this is a violation of uh, NI NIH uh, rules um, and uh, you know, to us represents an, an extremely um, egregious kind of behavior. Next slide. All right, so I've talked about the three major problems. I've talked about the undisclosed research support in the form of contracts and grants. I've talked about undisclosed conflicts of interest and I've talked about the uh, peer review. Let me end by uh, uh, sh uh, sharing um, some other observations. At this point, we have reached out to over 90 institutions, about 196 scientists um, of concern. By the way, the number today, I think is actually higher than that. I would point out that not all the scientists are ethnically Chinese. Most of them are, not surprising, given that the talents programs are targeting um, expats, but some of the, the best known cases right now, such as Charles Lieber and, and Alan List are people who are not ethnically um, Chinese. One thing that is interesting is that while nearly all fields of biomedicine appear to be represented, um, nearly all are involved in some kind of preclinical research. Um, this is consistent with what we've heard from other parts of government, defense, energy, computer science, um, physics, and, and that is that um, much of the focus seems to be on uh, basic science or pre-applied science. And so what we're seeing is consistent uh, with that. I mentioned to you that uh, we, have, we have encountered a number of lies. Um, and these are some of the other lies that we have seen. Some of these lies we've actually seen now more than once. Like, uh, it is true that I'm named as a PI on a Chinese grant, but I never wrote the grant. I never saw the grant. I allowed somebody else to use my name as the PI on the grant because I'm famous. And I thought that that would enable the grant to get funded. Um, another is I knew nothing about this grant, um, despite the fact that the grant was found on their email and, um, and they cited the grant as a source of support in their senior author um, publications. Um, another is I didn't actually do the work. Um, in other words, yes, it's true. I had the contract. Yes, it's true. I was a PI on a Chinese grant, but I never did the work and therefore there's nothing for you to worry about. And then another is the affiliations and published papers were an error. So uh, we see that they will cite their Chinese institution often as their primary affiliation, 
Um, and yet, um, uh, they'll, and, and they'll do this many, many, many times. And then they'll say, oh, that, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. I didn't mean to say that I was affiliated with Sichuan University. Uh, that, that, that was a mistake on my part. Uh, next. Um, these are some data that we presented to the ACD, um, the advisory committee to the director back in June. So th these are data as of last June. These numbers literally change every day, but um, just to give you a sense of where we are. So at, at that point, we had uh, reached out on 189 scientists and we had determined that 70% of them had an undisclosed foreign grant, over 50% of them had an undisclosed talents award, and then not quite 10% had an undisclosed uh, foreign company. Uh, there were fewer with the peer review violations. Over 80%, um, there was some serious uh, NIH violation. Um, interestingly enough, um, a number of institutions volunteered to us, even though they didn't have to, uh, that, uh, th that their employees had violated institutional rules. Uh, many universities um, have rules that say, you cannot apply to get research support through another institution without pre-approval by us first. And so just by applying for our research support uh, from a Chinese granting agency through a foreign institution, uh, that would represent a violation of an institutional rule. Um, at that point, uh, 54 scientists um, had been terminated or resigned as a consequence of uh, inquiries. And um, that number is higher now, it's, it's well over 60. Uh, and um, there were additional groups of scientists who uh, may not have been terminated or resigned from their institution, but the institutions recognized that the uh, NIH uh, violations were so serious that they were removing this, their scientists from the NIH ecosystem for, um, for a period of time. Okay, next. There's been a lot of interest and activity. Uh, on the left is a report. It was, this is a bipartisan report issued by the Permanent Subcommittee of Investigations from the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs. Uh, threats to the U.S. Research Enterprise China's Talent Recruitment Plans. Uh, this report is quite good. Uh, I had the opportunity to testify before the U.S. Senate last November um, about this. In the middle is an interesting and thoughtful report uh, that was commissioned by the National Science Foundation to the uh, Jason Group. The Jason Group is a group of scientists who have high-level security clearance. Um, this is a, an unusual Jason report in that it was unclassified. Uh, they talked about uh, the balance between fundamental research security um, and open science and collaboration at the same time. And then on the right is a Dear Colleagues letter that was sent by Kelvin Drogemeyer, who's the director of OSTP. Next slide. Uh, the universities um, have taken this quite seriously and we've been quite pleased by this. Uh, this was uh, uh, released by uh, AAU and APLU in May of 2020. They have collected and shared um, best practices uh, they had already done this back in April of 2019, and this is a, an updated report uh, and is uh, quite a detailed, thorough, uh, and thoughtful. Next slide. There are some uh, new concerns th uh, that are uh, coming up. One is about the military. Um, so on, on the left, this is a report about a scientist uh, who uh, did not disclose her military affiliation. She was working as a biomedical researcher at one of the University of California campuses, and she was arrested for uh, falsifying her visa application. Uh, we, we are aware now also through a recent Hoover report that NIH and NSF may have inadvertently funded uh, research um, at Chinese military institutions uh, without, you know, without our knowledge and without the knowledge of the uh, American uh, institution. Uh, this is a, a new area of concern for us and, and we'll see uh, where, where that goes. Uh, on the right is a, uh, a report by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. It's a nonpartisan think tank in Australia. Uh, the Australian government is ahead of us. Uh, they have been quite uh, seriously affected uh, by Chinese efforts to uh, steal intellectual property. Um, so this uh, points out that, uh, the, um, that the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party have set up um, recruitment stations all around the world. There may be over a hundred recruitment stations here um, in the United States uh, to recruit people into the talents programs. And, and we have encountered some of them where it turns out that the scientist that we are concerned about is not only 
uh, a member of the Thousand Talents program and receiving undisclosed support from the Thousand Talents program, but is actively recruiting scientists from their own institution or from other institutions um, to join the talents programs as well. Okay, next next slide. Um, the um, uh, this is a, a trans government effort. Uh, the White House Office uh, of Science and Technology Policy recently uh, released this slide deck uh, on the security and integrity of America's uh, research enterprise. We'd be very happy to share this uh, with you. Uh, NIH contributed a, a lot to this. Um, there is a group there called JCOR, the uh, Joint Committee on Research Environment, and there's a subcommittee on uh, science and security, which I'm a co-chair of. Uh, we are, uh, we've been working very closely with them. And the idea of this is that this is a trans government concern. It's not just an NIH concern. Uh, the FBI has launched a, a campaign uh, on the, what uh, it's called the National Counterintelligence Task Force. I'm one of the group leaders uh, of that. Um, and, and again, this is part of um, a trans government effort to deal with these um, problems. Next slide. Um, now, I haven't said anything about collaboration. And, and the reason is, is because everything I've talked about has nothing to do with collaboration. Uh, offshore bank accounts, secret cash payments, uh, undisclosed employment agreements, undisclosed grants, uh, undisclosed patents, um, none of those um, uh, uh, stealing NIH applications, undisclosed conflicts of interest, none of these represent um, collaborations. Um, this is from a, a website that Penn State University has put up, which we think is really quite good. And, and this language, um, I think, is absolutely spot on. So international collaborations are acceptable and, in fact, encouraged, but we urge researchers to err on the side of transparency. It protects everyone's interest, the federal government, Penn State, individual researchers, and their international collaborators to have international relationships disclosed and vetted to determine if there are any potential conflicts of commitment, duplications of research, and or diversion of intellectual property in the performance of federally funded research. And in fact, uh, through the actions of the Chinese talents programs and related programs, we have seen exactly this. We have seen conflicts of commitment, duplications of research, um, and diversion of IP in the performance of NIH funded research. The next slide, which is, I believe, the last slide. Um, I just want to point out that um, this is not um, an NIH effort alone. This is very much a team sport. Many people in the NIH have been involved with this. Uh, OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, is largely coordinating this, and it's been a great pleasure for us to work uh, with Kelvin Drogemeyer, Helena Fu, and Aaron Miles uh, there. Uh, we have very close working relationships with the Department of Justice, with FBI, with the um, Director of National Intelligence, uh, with the Office of the Inspector General within our um, Department of DHHS. There are international efforts um, that, are, uh, that are ongoing, um, and uh, this, um, the State Department um, has uh, reached out to uh, numerous other countries. We've been part of those uh, conversations. We've also had the opportunity to work with non-federal uh, organizations, um, including AAU, COGR, APLU, AAMC, and uh, FASEB. And then um, dozens of VPRs and institutional compliance and integrity leaders around the country whom we've had the opportunity to work with to discover the nature um, of the kind of problems that we're dealing with. So I, I hope you found this interesting um, and informative, um, and I would be happy to hear any thoughts or questions that you might have. Okay, thank you, Mike. It was most illuminating. I have several hands that have already gone up. So uh, Trey Idecker, Stephen Rich, and Sharon Plon. Trey, why don't you start us off? Hi, thanks. Thanks, Mike. I agree with Rudy. That was a really illuminating uh, presentation. And I think that, that for all of this to have the right perception, it's important that all of this information be put into the right context so that it's not seen as, as some kind of witch hunt or, or um, ascertainment bias extra you know, exercise as we're all sensitive to. So, so what would be great to have along with all of these, these reports, and I agree some of it is egregious, is the greater context of what's going on with regards to a worldwide analysis. So, so, for instance, China isn't the only country, as you know, that is competitive with the U.S. I remember once I was, many years ago, a standing member of an EU grants uh, panel 
where all the criteria were similar to NIH, except for a sixth criterion, which was competitiveness with US, <laughs> uh, which was, I, I found bizarre, but it was, it just was part of the review. Um, so have, has your office thought about a complete report looking at overlaps, you know, these, these different areas you mentioned, overlapping grant commitments. We all know that scientists love to play the game of repurposing uh, stuff. And, and a certain amount is appropriate as long as it can be separated. And, and so have, you know, can we place this, this particular uh, uh, range of offenses in that greater context of a complete analysis of, of the overlap in grants, a complete analysis of people's dual appointments, including with private sector appointments. I just was, while well, during your talk, I was finding a really interesting uh, editorial piece on the effectiveness of, of dual appointments in academia and industry and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then also in peer review, we, we know that there were lots of conflicts in peer review way beyond what, what you're mentioning. Anyway, I think I made my point. I think it's a great presentation and it, and it just needs to be delivered in the right context. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, completely agree. Uh, this is very much a work in progress. We do not know what the scale of this is yet. We know that there are other countries that have similar kinds of um, stealth uh, talents recruitment programs, though not at the same scale as China. Uh, one is Russia. We, we have a handful of cases right now that do involve Russia. Um, but uh, in, in a way, part of what the, uh, the counterintelligence task force program is all about is to get a, a much better handle on, on where this is. We don't know what the scale of this is yet. We, we're, not, we're not there yet. And, and what, you're, what you're saying is absolutely spot on. Steve Rich. Yes, hi, Mike. Thanks uh, so much for your presentation. And it's good to see you again. Uh, one of the things that, at least at our institution, uh, we've been pushing is complete transparency and you know, talking to all of our faculty about any type of relationship should be included. But it strikes me that like many things, you talk about it once and it has impact, but if you don't talk about it again for the next you know, year, two years, three years, it, it really starts wearing off and people forget and have other things. Is there a way that, you know, I guess NIH or others, I mean, we had this webinar just recently, like, as you said, are regarding a presentation on this. But it seems like there has to be some sort of uh, specific training almost in place uh, to, to really help make this uh, an, a real impactful uh, approach. Yes, um, so Steve, completely agree. Uh, OSTP, uh, this is something that Kelvin Drogemeyer alluded to in his recent talk to the uh, Federal Demonstration Partnership. So OSTP is working on uh, various guidance documents, toolkits and materials. Uh, for institutions, and we hope that that will come out fairly soon. And in addition, part of the um, counterintelligence task force efforts is exactly what you say, is instruction, education, outreach to, um, to institutions that would be continuous um, so that, uh, um, so that this, the, vi the vigilance will always be there. It, we, we have to find the right balance between an appropriate level of vigilance so that um, people are careful and, and don't do the wrong thing and that institutions are on top of what's going on. But at the same time, uh, we, don't want, we don't want people to forget on the one hand and we don't want this to be overbearing on the other. That's the, that's the challenge. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I've got Sharon Plon, Steve Fodor and Rafael Irizarry. Sharon, go ahead. Uh, well, thank you for that presentation. Um, I always gr grew up being called the Girl Scout, so it was really sort of hard to listen to. Um, but I just wanted to make a couple of quick points. So with regard to the last comment, as you mentioned, the Texas Medical Center was one of the early places that the FBI, FBI came to visit. And so Baylor has set up an entire new system, which interestingly is called disclosure of interest, not conflict of interest. Mm. Um, and is an entire web-based system that we have to use for every grant, every submission, um, everything. So I do think that there will be sort of a sea change. I did want to follow up on Trey that obviously your talk today focused on China. Uh, and certainly throughout my academic career, I've had colleagues from all parts of the world who have very proudly talked about having trainees in their home country, going to their home country for the summer, 
um, trying to support the science in their home institution. And to be honest, I have no idea what was disclosed or not disclosed. So I do think having some really clear metrics on how or instruction on how that can be done appropriately, um, because we don't want it to look like we're walling you off once you come here uh, and that you can't provide your expertise back to the country you're from, which may be one of the reasons you came to the United States to begin with. So I think in addition to showing all the ways it was done wrong, it would be really nice in a talk like this to give some of the examples of how it has been done correctly, where it was disclosed and it has been a successful relationship. I think that would go a long way. Thank I think you. you're, I, I think there are a number of graduate students who are very concerned about the issues around military service. And obviously there are many countries that actually require military service um, for all young individuals. So you could find a picture of almost anyone from that country in a uniform. And so I, I do think, again, it's really important to clarify what does prior military, and I, I'm sure you've investigated in these cases, but again, I don't wanna give the impression that anyone who's had military service then falls under the suspicion that they didn't disclose on their fellowship application that five years ago they served in their country's military just as every other person from their country does. Yeah, these are all great points, totally agree. We actually have seen some uh, examples of where things have gone uh, well. Um, so for my next time I do this, I'll, I'll, I'll give that as an example. Um, uh, regarding the military, the, the concern, you're right, there are countries in the world where there's universal conscription. Um, but the, the concern here is people who are employed by the military and are basically coming to the United States to work in a laboratory as part of their military assignment. And they do not disclose when they're asked, this is standard visa application, they're asked, are you currently on active service with the military? And, and they don't disclose that. And there's a reason why. Steve Fowder, please. Hey, Mike, thanks a lot for that really good presentation. That was, it was uh, good to see the overview and, and a lot of the comments are, are excellent. I, one thing I just wanted to clarify or maybe um, uh, return to, which is you sort of started off the conversation and the presentation on disclosure uh, and conflict of interest and so on. And then there was sort of a segue as we went in that when we got into um, you know, the sort of trade secret theft, intellectual property theft, and so on. And just think it's probably important to really separate those two. The conflict of interest, disclosure, and so on is very clear cut uh, and very easy to understand. Um, but I noticed the, the latter presentations, especially coming out of the, the government and so on, were much more about theft of uh, intellectual property. And I think it's been pointed out a number of times here, there are all sorts of situations where we have a free and open research enterprise in the United States. Uh, we have people from companies that visit research labs. We have people from academics that go to companies to uh, visit research labs. There's different types of disclosures about all those things and so on. But is this, is this really focused on transparency and disclosure. Um, and if it is, then it's important to really distinguish that from the incidence of um, you know, intellectual property theft. And I was just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Thank you. So uh, our focus here at NIH is primarily on transparency and disclosure, because as you say, most of the science that we, well, all the science that we fund is unclassified. And, um, and most of the science that we fund um, is not directly connected to IP with a capital I, capital P. So um, uh, I'll give you a, a to, um, to, to illustrate this. Um, one recent report we received from a, uh, um, from a major university described how their scientists had a, um, basically a full-time job in China, had not disclosed that. His laboratory in the United States was falling apart. Nobody knew where, where this guy was. And in the meantime, he was telling them that he was working there um, full-time. So he was effectively taking um, university property 
and using it to build his, uh, his operation in China and his time. I mean, if you think about another thing that was going on was the university was entitled to 12 months of his time and, and they weren't getting that. They were maybe getting two months um, of his time. And it manifested itself by a complete absence of disclosure um, and transparency. So from our end here at NIH, our primary focus is, is disclosure and transparency. Raphael. Hi, Raphael. thanks. Yeah, okay. just finding the unmute button. Yeah. Thanks. thanks for the presentation. I, I, the, my, my main suggestion is that we make that uh, very easily available to everybody, to the public. I know this is open session, so it's it's currently public. But uh, I would I would like to to share this presentation with many people um, sure. as soon as possible. Uh, so so you you showed us some clear cut examples, and one, and one other reason I think you should share it because I I I've, I've heard people uh, describe this as a witch hunt, as was said earlier, but it clearly isn't. There's clearly something going on. And, and, and by, by seeing your presentation, I think people will be convinced that this is an actual concern. Um, so that's my first point. The, the, the one thing I wanted to maybe get some advice on, you, you presented some very obvious cases. I think it, it would be useful to see some more ambiguous ones too, and maybe ones that aren't a problem because I can see now institutions uh, overreacting to this in, in, in a sense. I mean, I, I think we, we definitely want to be careful and this is why I think we need to make this very public. But there's also, you, you can see how universities will now be a, a concerned about not disclosing something. So they want to disclose every single thing. And then it, it, it creates a lot of work for everybody, maybe unnecessarily, including for the NIH. So one of the specific instances of this that I've already seen happening a bit is open source software where you get contributions from people and sometimes people start working on your software uh, without pay and some and many times they're from other countries and sometimes this software is part of, of, of work that is being funded by the NIH so that that could become quite cumbersome to have to start disclosing every person that helped uh, sometimes we don't even know their name. Sometimes we only know their like their handle on GitHub. So that's one. And the other one is vi short-term visitors from other countries, students that want to learn from us. I'm thinking of all countries. So someone wants to come spend three months in our lab as a visitor and they have funding from the other country. So under the definitions I'm listening to here, it seems like that would be something that needs to be disclosed as, as a foreign contribution to to my to a lab, or maybe not. So I, I guess my my request is that we also show some cases where first some ambiguous ones that 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 are a problem, and then maybe some some cases that aren't, so that people can see the different uh, the different uh, cases and which ones are a problem, which ones aren't. Also, we could have like a very clear policy written up that that describes what is and what isn't a, something that needs to be disclosed. Right. Uh, thank you very much. I, I agree. Um, I, one thing we could also share is uh, we have a new website that we've put up. Um, some of it ha has been uh, inspired by what uh, various universities around the country have done. Uh, so we'll, we'll be happy to share that with you. It's got a lot of material um, on there. And this presentation that I just gave is public. You, you can share it with anybody. Including, including the, 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 your, your description? Because oh, that absolutely. was great. Like like your your voice over, yeah. I, this is being recorded, so yeah, this is public. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this will be posted on on yeah. Genome TV, our YouTube channel. This will all be public. You'll have you can point to it very easily. Okay, yeah, sure. It's just that this is more than just a presentation. It would be nice to just have that part. You know, you can point people to the right minute. So, Mike, if you're not part of a law enforcement agency, is it possible to discover foreign if individuals have foreign funding? Yes, it's and, and actually, it's in some cases it's remarkably uh, easy. Uh, but if, if this is like um, diagnosis in medicine, if you don't know what you're looking for, you're not going to find it. 
Um, so uh, one way um, that, in fact, our program staff started to discover problems um, several years ago. At the same time that we were working with the FBI, some of our program staff started knocking on the door and saying, we're seeing some weird things here. Can you explain this? So what you, you look at is you look at the published record, you look at publications, and in the publications, they will cite foreign affiliations and foreign grants uh -huh. that don't appear in your grant records. And that's the first clue that, that something is going on. And they have to do that. They have to cite those, um, those foreign affiliations and foreign grants um, because that's how they get credit for, um, for the work that they do. Um, so that's, that's the first clue. The second is, is that if, if you're, a number of institutions um, clearly have cultures where, um, where accountability is taken seriously. And so they get tips. Um, and uh, so institutions have received anonymous tips. We have received anonymous tips. Some of these tips are remarkably detailed. And then you follow up on those tips um, and uh, find out that there's a problem. OK, we have another question from Jeff Botkin. Yeah, thank you, Megan. I guess my comment uh, sort of follows up on that observation. <clears throat> I know the NIH conflict of interest process and rules pretty well. And that really is focused almost exclusively on the disclosure and identification of uh, issues and very little on how to manage those or what the standards and expectations are. Uh, and I think a big part of the problem in this whole domain is a lot of the people who are getting into this sort of difficulty are the most senior people, are the most productive uh, and influential people at institutions. And so it makes it very difficult for institutions to politically do uh, what they ought to be doing. And so hopefully in this process, uh, standards for responding to these sorts of conflicts and expectations uh, at the institutional level will help institutions not only identify the issues, but take uh, strong stands on them. Thank you. Okay, last call for questions for Mike. Mike, thank you very much. Really engaging uh, presentation. And as Eric noted, his slides and his uh, recording will be available and for you to download and to distribute. So um, thank you. Goodbye, Mike. Thank you, thank you um, Mike. Uh, for the rest of the council members and, and visitors, we're about two hours, 15 minutes into the council meeting. Let's take a break now. Uh, do not disconnect from the Zoom meeting. Just mute your microphones. And we'll see you back here. We'll resume open session with the presentation on concepts at 2.15 p.m. East Coast time. Okay.